team are hoping that in a few weeks, all their work on the farm will pay off when they bring in the wheat harvest. <sighs> Joys of summer, Peter. Good to see the sun on the wheat. Yeah, it's for the first time this year, basically. It's been the wettest summer for a century, and their flax crop has already failed. Everything now depends on the success of the wheat. Still pretty green, is it? Still pretty green. See, that's really wet. Yeah. Isn't it? That's a long way off. I mean, we've got, what, another few weeks on this? I would have said so. So what are we going to harvest this with? Well, I think we should go for one of the new fangled machines of the day, a combined harvester. You know, something that not only cuts it, it threshes it in the field. It will combine cutting and threshing. Using a combined harvester will be crucial to getting every last scrap of wheat from the field. A job that in 1945 was more important than ever. All through the war, wheat yields had been rising. But now, they started to fall. After five years of record crops, the fertility of Britain's fields was in decline. To compensate, imports would have to increase. But there was a new threat to shipping. Early in the war, U-boats like this destroyed shipping. But in 1945, the Nazis launched a high-speed version, posing a major new threat to imports. Braced for a crisis, the government ordered farmers to restore fertility to their fields. There she is. Well, well. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> the team are using a muck spreader. We've got to put some heart back in the land, and this is the machine that's going to enable us to do it. Right, we'll load you up, and then we'll send you off. Marvellous. Muck, or animal dung, is a crucial source of nutrition for the soil. It improves <laughs> soil structure and adds organic substances to help plants grow. <laughs> it's the wind! You're downwind! What can I do? Mitigate against it. <laughs> Vicious, isn't it? It's giving a good even dressing, isn't it? It is. It's really chopping it up. Although it was desperately needed, the amount of manure available to farmers declined sharply during the war. Early on in the conflict, the government had brought in a policy of slaughtering livestock that could not be fed. Millions were culled, and the knock-on effects were now being felt. Towards the end of the war, many farmers were beginning to ask whether it had been wise to lose so many animals from British farming. We've seen so many sheep and so many beef cattle lost in agriculture, and as a consequence, we'd lost their manure, we'd lost their dung, and that, for years, centuries, had been used to put heart back into the land. With the land exhausted and crop yields in danger, the government knew that record food production couldn't be sustained through another year of war. to Berlin, and it seemed likely the Nazi regime would soon fall. On the 7th of May came the news Britain had been fighting for for so long. Germany surrendered.
following announcement. It is understood that in accordance with arrangement between the three great powers, tomorrow, Tuesday, will be treated as Victory in Europe Day and will be regarded as a holiday. The following day... Wow. Beginning and the end. Mm. Mm. It's hard to think, really, of the relief people must have felt. I mean, to be told officially that, you know, victory was was about to happen, the, yeah. the V word. That sort of secession of danger. Yeah, killing, the killing has the stopped. The killing has stopped. But of course... In Europe. In, uh, only in Europe, yeah. Mm. Must have been strange for them. Living in this world where you go outside at night and there's not a single pinprick coming from any house. There's, there's never been any fireworks. There's been relatively yeah. few parties. And then all of a sudden, the next couple of days, it must have just erupted. Yeah. And as you say, the, the sheer relief. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should have some sort of celebration, but perhaps try and bring in people who do have some memory of, yeah, of nice. victory in Europe and, really nice. and really see how they remember it, see what they think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's That'd a very be nice. nice idea. Yeah, you might need a scrub up there. <laughs> I know, I know. And I need a new collar. <laughs> Here's to victory in Europe. Here's to victory, to victory in Europe. <laughs>
were relatively new. Earlier designs had been powered by unwieldy sources like steam engines. The new technology was accessible to all. And we've got a ticking sound. That's right, the ticking sound is the unit operator. Tick, tick. It's sending pulses of high voltage along the fence. Right. When you or the animal touches the wire, you make the circuit between here and ground, I'm with so you. you get the shock. I'm with you. <laughs> How do I know that's working? Well, the countryside way of doing it is with a blade of grass. Right. So all you need is a nice blade of grass. Yep. So just rest the grass on the wire, so you are now completing the circuit. Is that going to... oh, yeah. <laughs> That's nasty. It is. That's isn't a nasty it? little nip, that is. I don't think it would take many shocks for, no. for a cow no, to think. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. That's great. I mean, that really is fantastic. We'll be able to muck evenly the field. Exactly. And that's what wartime Britain desperately needed. It needed that fertility back in the soil. Preparations for the VE Day party are underway. Ruth's putting the finishing touches to her baked potato pie. Now, the odd thing about this recipe is that it calls for orange juice and orange zest. I don't know where I kept an orange living in the countryside during the war. However, I had a bit of a scout around, and I've come up with a recipe for mock orange juice, which I think will do the trick. It's Swede, really, that you peel and slice, and then sprinkle a couple of teaspoons of sugar over and leave it overnight, and the juice of the Swede comes out. And that... It's supposed to taste slightly orangey. It smells like Swede. But there is a certain oranginess about it. It's quite amazing, actually. Well, I'm just going to put a splash in, I think. Right. I'm to spread jam and then my mixture on top. Hopefully, people will like it. With the fence up, it's time to bring in the cows. Come, Come on. on. It's not easy. Come on. Up, Come up, up, up. There's there better grass go. in the field. There they go. Oh, look. Straight to the fence. Did she get a I, shot? I don't know. They're doing clear of the fence, aren't they? They are. Come on. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Philip. Thank you. <laughs> Celebrations have begun. That's the one. 25? What is that? Fake potato pie. Are you sure? I am. Should you in a bit? Okay, wait, you're fake. I can't work out if that's good or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone. Come and gather round. Up and down the country, people joined together to pay tribute to Britain's war leader, Winston Churchill. And now, oh, what wonderful luck. At this moment, at this moment, how wonderful. Mr Churchill has come out onto the Ministry of Health balcony. He stands now in the floodlight and he's giving the victory sign with all his might from the floodlit balcony. Your victory. Victory of the cause of freedom. Well, I think Winston Churchill deserves a rabble-rousing chorus of For He's a Jolly Good Fellow. Yeah. So, one, two, three... Yeah. For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all us. team have invited along guests with first-hand memories of VE Day. Mary Davy and Stamper and John Curtis. What was it like in the countryside VE Day? Because obviously, I mean, I've only ever seen it from the perspective of uh, Trafalgar Square, London. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was quite good fun in the country. All the little villages and towns had their celebrations and the streets and things and dancing went on for mm. ages at night and everybody was chuffed a bit. The, a big party it was on the recreation ground yeah. with a firework party and 
um, there was a set piece with fireworks going off. And, oh, right, okay. So, yeah, it was, uh, that, that was really the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. Yeah. And the thing I really remember about it was that one of these set pieces was an elephant. Right. And when it went off, the trunk moved and I think the tail moved and I can remember everybody <laughs> laughing and clapping and I'd never seen anything like it and I just thought that was wonderful. Very oh, clear wow. memory still. Many people on VE Day were looking forward to loved ones coming home. But for those with relatives fighting in the Far East, the end was not yet in sight. Mary Davies' father had been sent to Malaya. On VE Day, her mother had no idea where he was. And she actually put a, an advert in a local paper mm, talking about my dad. And she said, if anyone lately returned from Malaya can give any information, I will be most grateful with a photograph of my dad. A heartfelt plea, isn't it? Yes. Mm. And from that Gosh. came a letter from a Captain Pierce. And I think this really, he says, I was for a time at the camp in Thailand. He died on the 21st of September, 1943. This was 1946, by the time my mum had this information. Gosh. So she was a long time Waiting. not knowing. Is this you at the time? This is... Yes, this is my brother, Jimmy, and I, and herself. So on VE day, then, her husband's missing. She hasn't got a clue what's going on. She's looking after two small children. And yet, somehow, in the midst of all that, she manages to find reasons to be cheerful. Yes, so she was helping to put on this street party. But for her, it wasn't over. There's a certain strength there, isn't there? I found this lovely bit of editorial here from Farmers Weekly. It's um, 1945, May the 11th. So it's the first edition after VE Day. And of course, the headline is victory. But the key message in here is about the fact that the struggle still goes on. And then it says here, the soldier returns from battle, the farmer's battle goes on. It will be a very long time indeed before his unending fight can see its own kind of victory in a healthy, strong, well-fed population throughout the countries of the world. Tomorrow, we must face a future exacting and difficult as anything we have known in the last five years. We know that, and we do not propose to evade it. After VE Day, a new food crisis began. Across Europe, farmland and infrastructure had been destroyed and many war-torn nations could no longer grow their own food. Mass starvation loomed. Britain's farmers were called upon to intensify their efforts as the nation suddenly had to send thousands of tons of food abroad, including as an occupying force to Germany. The wheat crop of 1945 now became even more critical. Manor Farm's wheat is almost ready to harvest. Alex and Peter are making plans for the arrival of the combine. Carry my measuring stick with me, Peter, just in case we need to size up any problems that we are confronted with. So, over 12 feet it's long. Yeah. Which means we should be able to get it in here. Yeah. We might just have to pin back some of this shrubbery. But before they get the machine in the field, there's another problem to address. Until the invention of the combine, harvesting machinery simply cut the wheat and left it to dry in the field. Only after drying would it be threshed. Now the combine would cut and thresh in one go, and the drying stage would be missed out. This meant the grain could be too wet to store away. Farmers had to find a solution. We should be able to make quite an easy makeshift grain dryer something quite simple yeah i think i think it would be i think it'd be a good idea if we did bring the grain in moist and we hadn't made a grain dryer the ministry of agriculture would be breathing down our necks asking us why we hadn't making a grain dryer will require some ingenuity 
After VE Day, a huge rebuilding program got underway in Britain's bomb-damaged cities. Conventional building materials had been rationed throughout the war and were now even harder to come by. Hi, Pete. Hi, Colin. How are you? Conservation officer Colin Richards has come to help the team improvise. Well, these are the bits and pieces which should hopefully make the grain dryer. I notice they're all irregular in shape and size, yeah, so sorry about that. <laughs> we're going to have to scratch our heads as to how we can make this old gate our platform to dry the grain on. Right, OK. We've got to create a platform with a fire underneath, drive off the moisture, and that's our grain dryer. First job is to dig a hole for the fire to sit in. Before long, the rain arrives. This is why we need the grain dryer. Almost there. All year, we've been battling with the weather. We've had so much rain this year. Yeah. It has not been fun. It's a nightmare. It's been the worst year on record for weather. Yeah. It really has. And I can only hope that those heroes of wartime farming are looking down on us now, Peter. <laughs> and laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Lost turf. The base of the grain drying platform will be a layer of scrap iron needs to be flattened. Right. Look, I'll give you a rhythm. Come on. You know the lyrics to uh, Camp Town Races? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do da day. Oh, do da day. <laughs> Perfect. Look at that. Just Flat enough for you? Brilliant, Peter. In 1945, with the threat of German invasion gone, Land defences were broken up, leaving behind handy debris. Oh, that's, that's perfect, isn't it? Yeah. This is the type of material that was round in 1945 when they started to dismantle the roadblocks and the checkpoints. Um, sure. And it was a sort of ready source of material. It's recycling at its best. Good. Perfect. Right. Well, we'll have some more of this, I think, then, Peter. OK. <laughs> will be supported by pillars. We've got my scrub half days. Number eight. What we're doing is we're separating the fire from the grain and the bricks act as a radiator, radiating that heat through the grain, drying it, and allowing you to sort of store it without it going mouldy. The drying surface must be perfectly level to ensure the crop is dried evenly. You know he's cockeyed, don't you? All right. We first started out with um, a whole bunch of scrap metal, blocks of concrete, an old gate. And we're actually attempting to do a very technical thing in reducing the moisture level in grain, and I was really sort of skeptical. But now looking at this, feeling a little bit more confident about getting this grain to the right standard for the Ministry of Agriculture. When the grain dryer's finished, the team will be prepared to harvest the wheat. Farming had been controlled by the government's war agricultural executive for six years. They dictated almost every aspect of farming, from where to grow crops to what to feed chickens. Then, in July, just a few weeks after VE Day, farmers were given the chance to shape future food production when a general election was held. Hello. Hello, must be Nick. All right. Nice to meet you. Come on in. I think we've got the kettle on. Excellent. <laughs> Historian Nick Mansfield has studied the election. Peter, Nick. How do you do? Please meet you. <laughs> Cup of tea. Do sit down. Ooh, do please. sit down. Wartime Britain was governed by a coalition led by the Conservative Prime Minister Winston Churchill.
Agriculture was central for both main parties, and farmers were faced with a stark choice. So we've got Mr Churchill's declaration to the, uh, to the electors, the, so that's Tory the Tory one. Party. The Tory one. The emphasis is on the empire, which will bring in food and so forth. They then went on to say the wartime directions and controls will be cr progressively reduced as our food situation improves. So the Tories then are proposing to sort of be very hands off and leave it all to market forces. That's right. Um, whereas, whereas Labour, a say in wartime, the county war executive committees have organised production in that way. As you know, they brought in mechanisation on a huge scale, uh, fertilisation and, and so forth. Now, the Labour Party intends that their work shall continue in peacetime. So bearing in mind that we got the Tory party sort of suggesting that we should go entirely with market forces in the countryside and then the Labour Party suggesting that we should hang on to the government procedures that have been in place during the war. I mean, what do you think? In 1945, what would you have gone for? It is a very tough question, it isn't, is, it? isn't it? Because I can see the benefits of getting rid of the war, but e equally I can see how keeping the status quo it was definitely working. The government has put up a, a framework upon which in, in which farming can operate. So maybe you, you, you're thinking, actually, this is working. It, well, the first line of the part of the Labour Party manifesto is agriculture is not only a job for the farmers, it is also a way of feeding the people. It's, it's still calling on that whole wartime, we're all in it together, yes. sort of a spirit. Yes. The Labour Party emerged victorious with one of the biggest landslides in election history. The party won more purely rural seats than it ever has before or since. The idea of government control over farming in peacetime would now be enshrined in law. Nothing was ever the same again. Yeah. When the Conservatives returned to power in 1951 uh, again, um, they accepted the Agricultural Bill entirely, and, and the rest is history. It, it's the basis of, of post-war uh, prosperity for British agriculture. Many aspects of the 1940s legislation are still in force today. The grain dryer is built and the wheat is almost ready to bring in. But before they begin cutting, the team have one last job they want to tackle, setting up a party to celebrate the harvest. There's a wartime scheme they're using for inspiration. Holidays at home was a government initiative to counter extreme wartime working conditions. With many factories operating 24 hours a day, employees often worked seven days a week. Ministers knew people would become exhausted without regular breaks. But they didn't want to encourage travel as the roads were needed for troops and freight. The answer was holidays at home. Anyone home? Local volunteers were asked to put on festivities. You might have seen these around. So oh, yes, holidays up. at home. Dog show, we can definitely enter the dog show. All oh, right, you're <laughs> in for that, there's no, no problem. Holidays at home will be the perfect way to round off the harvest. And Alex wants the party to go with a bang. Hello, Steve. Alex. Thanks for coming along. He's enlisted the help of pyrotechnics expert Steve Allison to put together a wartime fireworks display in the shape of an elephant. I've heard about elephants being used for exactly these purposes, so I'm really intrigued to see how the whole thing works. Yeah, it's quite a popular lance work, the elephant. Yeah. So you say lance works? Lance work, yes. Like lance work is uh, pictures in fire. OK. Got to bear in mind that fireworks were, weren't quite as spectacular, and this was the way of getting the sort of a moving picture, as it right, were. Right, OK. So is it, it's got moving parts, then, has it? It has. Well, hopefully the trunk's going to be moving at the ah, end there. Wonderful. Great. So you're working from a template that you've sketched out here. We have, and then the fireworks will be placed on the outline. Right. And then when they're lit, you'll see the pinpoints of light and the picture outlined. So the ears. Now, we're going for African elephant here or Indian? That ear size is just perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I think the African elephant, I think. I think. African <laughs> elephant, yeah. yeah. OK, that's fine by me. In there? You happy? Yeah, that's, that's good. 
fireworks were banned at the start of the war, and all existing supplies had to be handed over to police. Factories that made them were converted to produce munitions. <laughs> now, the business end of this structure, the fireworks, you've got some here on display. Are these the ones we're going to be attaching? Uh, no, I don't think so. The ones we're going to be attaching, much plainer. These are pre-war, right. they would have been in the shops. Okay. By the, rather like a selection box. So these are the sort of things then that had actually been banned by the time we get to 1939, 1940. Absolutely. War in the air. The shape of things to come, unfortunately. Yes, yeah, rather prophetic, actually. Very much so. What's so, this one? This is the jumping that's, that's jack. That's the jumping jack. You like that, and so it would chase a... you around the garden. Wow. But we're not going to use these fireworks here to attach to our uh, elephant, are we? No, we're not. We're going to go for a plain white. Right, OK. You know? And that's your lance, rather like a cigarette. But that I wouldn't smoke it. You know? <laughs> the lances will be fastened to the trellis with double-pointed nails and linked together with quick match. Cotton covered with gunpowder mixture covered in paper. This is all incredibly technical because your worst-case scenario is you light one corner of this thing, it gets, say, halfway up the leg and then just goes out. Absolutely. And you certainly wouldn't see an elephant. No. Uh, a bit of a disaster, really. <laughs> It'll take several hours and 180 lances to complete the firework elephant. For three months after VE Day, Britain remained at war in the Far East. Then, on August the 6th, a terrifying new weapon was unleashed over Japan. The atomic Soon the end of the Second World. Wild celebrations erupted in the USA. But in Britain, a new set of challenges emerged. Since 1941, the government had been dependent on financial support from America, and this was soon cut off. Britain was essentially bankrupt and unable to afford imported food. So the nation's farms, exhausted from the conflict, were called on to step up production to even greater heights. Gonna be tight. Look at that! Oh, we are talking about half an inch there. But half you are an inch, through. But we're in. You are through. My word. The Alice Chalmers All Crop 60 was manufactured throughout the 1940s. Its owner was local farmer Lou Hazel. Right. <coughs> so this is. The combined harvester. I mean, this is the thing that's combining not only the cutting, but the threshing of the crop. Correct. Now, you're going to show me how this works, yeah? Right. Quite simple. The knife there goes backwards and forwards, cuts the grain. The reel goes round and round. You're sort canvas. of knocking it into the blade, yes. yeah? OK. And as soon as it's cut, it falls back onto the canvas, which conveys it up to the top. And it goes into the cylinder, the thrashing cylinder. The thrashing cylinder removes the grain from the ears of wheat. So that... Right, that cylinder goes round. Oh, I'm with you. It contains iron bars coated with rubber. The rubber covering there gives the seed a gentle thrash, so it's not making uh, aggressive action to it to, to, oh. to crack the, the kernel. It doesn't, br it doesn't, br it it break doesn't it bruise out. or break the seed. Correct. OK. Yeah. Once the grain has been knocked out, it's separated from the straw by slatted conveyors moving towards the other side of the combine. Finally, the grain encounters a series of sieves, which get rid of any remaining straw. All of those processes that had once all been done back at the barn, back in the threshing barn, are all being done here on the back of the harvester. Correct. <laughs> Does it work, is the question. Oh, yes. Right, OK. Oh, yes. Well, I think we'll... Well, well they claim it will thrash over 100 different crops. OK. 
So it's got about 100 different plants out there to thrash through, what with all the weeds. But let's oh. hope <laughs> we just get some grain in the bags. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> all right, well, let's see it started. Modern combine harvesters are self-propelled, but this one is pulled by a tractor, oh. which means there are two engines to start. Close. I never see another crank handle for as long as I live, Lou. I'll, I'll die a happy man. Two or three minutes for the engine to warm up, then we can start cutting. Right. If you put it on that one, yeah, yeah. right. That way. That is always the case with these things. Incredibly tense for Peter and myself. You know, this is a whole year building up to this harvest. And the thing is, is you're working with kit and equipment which is over 70 years old. But here we go. Combine is off to a good start. We're making progress, but there's so much green material in the bottom there. jammed in under the reel. We've had a jam, and the problem is, is there's so much filth, there's so much weed in the base of this crop that the cutter's struggling to get through it. Wet grass, yeah. losing traction, not going well. No. Weed-ridden wheat was a symptom of the wartime directive to plough up land that had never been used to grow crops before. I mean, this is the type of land you wouldn't dream of putting a crop in here, would you? No. Outside of wartime conditions. It is the battle for food, and this is the final push to get this in. And it's going to take a Herculean and heroic effort to yeah. get it in, isn't it? How's it looking? Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> That's not the word we are. At least he's honest. If they can't get the combine working, the team will have to harvest the field by hand, taking around four days to cut and two to thresh. The combine is capable of doing both jobs in less than one day. Ruth setting up the harvest celebration. Holidays at home. The government issued guidelines on how to get the most out of time. Have you seen this menu leaflet suggested for holidays at home? It's quite incredible. I like this bit. Um, what about mother? Too often she has to spend long hours in a hot kitchen trying to cope with all the tremendous appetites of the rest of the family. This is all wrong! No. <laughs> Mother needs a change from the kitchen just as much as father needs one from the office or the children from school. But then, you see, how can this be managed? By careful menu planning. Basically, you've got to spend oh, the week course. before your holiday. <laughs> Indeed. Getting doing all extra work. Doing extra work. <laughs> Mm. Some <laughs> holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we'd have a go at look, Monday's, Monday's sandwiches suggestion. Sandwiches made with pilchard and cabbage spread. Oh, that's delicious. That's awesome. The recipe calls for pilchard, cabbage, vinegar, salt, and mustard. Mm, that, that looks less appetizing, doesn't it? Mm, yeah. Should be brave and taste it a little bit. Yes, Okay. Here we go. That's all right. <laughs> Generally, that's all right. Oh, it's actually it's very good. <laughs> Jim, I'm like, what a surprise! Are we ready to go or what? Hang on, An hour of adjustments have unclogged the combine, and the harvest can continue. Oh. 
my first bag. This is it. You just put your hand in here, though. You can feel the moisture. Yeah. It feels damp. We'll have to get this. We'll have to get this dried pretty smartish. But having said that. This was beyond our wildest expectations about a month ago. It, it really is. This is fantastic. One, two, three. There we go. Blimey. To the grain dryer. Collins on hand to get the grain dryer up to temperature. I like this, Alex. Is this you? Yeah, little message there. Thought it was quite. Pertinent. The fire needs to die down before the grain can be dried. Thinking, hey, egg. Yeah. <laughs> when you said a grain drying kiln, it's not quite what I had in mind, I must no, admit. No, it's incredibly <laughs> makeshift. Ruth's brought along a batch of the pilchard sandwiches. I'm starving. Wow. This is definitely one of those recipes that I was really worried about. But it seems to come out all right. Mm. Unusual. They're Delicious. good, aren't they? Yeah. I know. Taste the mm. sea. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so we're going to have a lovely holidays at home then, are we? I think, it, oh, I think we will. Jolly if good. Well, we've got fireworks as well. Oh, good stuff. But we've got a lot of hard work ahead of us. Oh, there we go. Know, they didn't last long, no, did they? That was delicious. The fire's under control and the drying surface hot. But before the team can dry any grain, there's one final calculation they must make. The wartime target was to store grain with a moisture content of around 14%. Any more than that, and there was a risk it would go mouldy over winter. Right. You got it? Yep. The team need to know how wet the crop is to start with. Historian John Martin has come to help with this crucial stage. Oh. Hi, Alex. Hello, John. How are you? All right? Yeah, not too bad. Good to see you Hi, again. John. It's not the prettiest grain you'll ever well, see. That's very typical of uh, lots of the grains which were cut in the war. Weeds were really quite common. So as a wartime crop, it's not looking too bad? No, it looks reasonably good. OK. John's plan is to measure out three pounds of the grain. Oh, that's better. There they are. Yep. On the nail. Dry it and then re-weigh it. The amount of weight that's been lost will be the amount of moisture that was in the original grain. You know, we've just got a set of scales here mm. and we're doing a very arbitrary test, but surely the Ministry would have had much more high-tech equipment. Well, they would, but it wouldn't have... Because it was uh, in short supply, it wouldn't have been available for all farmers. Right. And they've got to kind of, in the war, improvise it as best they can. You can feel the heat in that. That is really drying quite quickly. The grain's beginning to feel different. You feel it. Yeah. The team are about to find out how much moisture is in their precious crop. We have got here two pounds and four ounces. The grain has lost around a quarter of its original weight, meaning it had a moisture content of 25%. This would have been too high for the Ministry of Agriculture, who were looking for it to be around 14%. OK, so we know what we've got to do now in terms of drying on here. Yeah. We know the thickness of the bed of grain we need. We, need, we know how long we need to cook it on here and what type of heat we need to keep up. Yeah. The thing is, we've got a lot of sacks to get through, yeah. so I think we should start by getting on with it. With the makeshift dryer working, the farmers are on course to bring in the crop to the standard day when men were men, Peter. <laughs> You're right, Peter. Good. Hold fast, man. On it goes. Oh, oh. That's good, that's good. We're getting it. OK. There's another dozen of them sacks. <laughs> <laughs> How are you feeling about this thing, Colin? Mate? If we do this for sort of half an hour, an hour, mm -hmm. then I think we'll actually dry this batch. That's good, that's good news. Let's get drying. You know what this calls for? Go on. A beer. A beer? A beer. Oh, my <laughs> word. <laughs> Gee. Thank you. The success of the food production campaign went far beyond the fishers' pre-war plans. 
never before had output increased so rapidly in such a short period of time. John Martin is one of the country's leading authorities on wartime farming. So let's get this straight. If we were to try and sort of rank the, the battle for food and the battle for harvest, as you call it, up against things like the Battle for Britain, um, Dunkirk or D-Day, we can see it as a success, a victory one. Oh, I think it was a, a clear victory. Um, we, it saved us from malnutrition and really starvation. Right. It's a crowning achievement because Britain entered the war with two-thirds of its population being fed on imported food. As much as it must have been hard, it must have given so many people a purpose. I think that's very true. It's a neglected story that people uh, committed themselves to a, a war effort and the countryside committed itself to winning the war. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think we are sitting on the brink of our own victory. <laughs> Everything seems to be going to plan. So, cheers. Fingers cheers. crossed. Here's to the heroes of wartime farming. Cheers. All of them. Yeah. By the end of the war, the fields of Britain were producing double what they had in the 1930s. It was an unprecedented accomplishment, but it created a legacy which has never left the countryside. Tractors enabled six and a half million acres of grassland to be ploughed up in areas often now protected by law. Of chemical fertilizers nearly tripled. They remained part of agriculture ever since. But despite increasing yields, some people feel the chemicals have caused irreparable damage to the farming landscape. These are all implements that actually do allow you to grow crops in, in areas that you probably wouldn't normally have grown crops. It's almost as if you become absolute master over that landscape, and, and that's, that, that's frightening. The policy of slaughtering animals that couldn't be fed caused livestock numbers to plummet. Many livestock, now classified as rare breeds, became rare because of the wartime cold. The focus has been not upon the, the farmyard and the farm stock, but out in the fields. That's felt quite different. A yard that's empty of animals, empty of that routine. Um, a very quiet farmyard in some ways. The war forged a link between government and farmers that was closer than ever before. I mean, governmental control at this sort of level it was a necessity, and to be brutally honest, it worked. What it did ensure is that we did have enough food to feed every single person on this island. As a result of the wartime agricultural revolution, the farmers in Britain found themselves on a technological treadmill, constantly seeking to maximize output. Eventually, the revolution became the basis of agriculture as we know it today. With the combine making quick work of the field and the grain drying going well, the team's work on the farm is coming to an end. Celebration is underway. And holidays at home. Wow! <laughs> Whoa, look at this. <laughs> That's quite a sight, isn't it? Weather like this, I'd have a holiday at home. <laughs> Decent location for our fireworks. What have we got, though, for fireworks? I mean, now well, you'll have to wait and see, won't you, Peter? I'll have to wait and see. Surprise! Holidays at home harvest celebration is underway. As well as transforming agriculture, war caused social upheaval across Britain. That summer saw the first wave of people released from war work. 
Among them were some of the two million women who'd been mobilised, often into jobs traditionally done by men. Women's lives were so turned upside down during the war, and I know immediately after the war, things seemed, for a while, to go back to exactly the same way they had. But they didn't really, because inside people's heads, something had changed, and it could never completely go back. <laughs> There was no let up in shortages of everyday items. Is this the case? Yes. <laughs> Food rationing would continue until 1954. Other commodities like clothes also went on being rationed. The wartime mentality would have to endure long after the conflict was over. I think the thing I've enjoyed most about the year is the resourcefulness. Uh, there's no doubt about it. just didn't exist a concept of throwing things away. And that, for me, is probably the biggest lesson that, that I can take away from that period. Have your dogs go down? Down? Good. I hope he's not giving marks for handler's appearance. <laughs> and the winner is... Henry. Oh, well done, Henry. We've forgotten the austere measures that people had to take during this period. They had to sacrifice things. They had to make do amend. And it's not just a mindset that was in the individual. It was a mindset of the nation. It was a collective, let's just do it. Falls, it's time to reveal the firework elephant. Wow. Are we ready? What a fantastic way to end our year. You know, after six years of war, seeing something so magical. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> you can read about the Second World War in books, but to actually come out here, to actually try and walk, even just for a few footsteps, in their shoes, to really understand what it must have been like to be in this country, to be up against it. It does change you. It feels like being demobbed. <laughs> a bit like that, isn't it? Back into City Street. But, yeah. I should have worn my spare pair of clothes, you know. <laughs> Look a bit smart. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing that has had the biggest impact on me this year has been that talking, that connecting with people who were really there. I don't think I'd ever really, truly done that. I just feel a sense of connection with that generation that I never thought I would. It's been a great year. Enjoyed yourself? Yeah, I'm going to be sad to go. Mm. Yeah. And of course, it's a countryside that will never be the same again. Change forever. It's so basic, isn't it, food? Mm. <laughs> it underpins everything. Is that it? Yeah, that looks like our yep. ride. I've really found myself admiring the feats of the people that worked on the land. The farmers, the war ag, the land girls, I mean, everyone who contributed. 
Now, I lift my hat to those people. They really did win the battle for food. Ding, ding. Where to next? I think the seaside. I like the seaside. I like the seaside. Seaside roof, you fancy that? <laughs> That'd be good.